I'm Linda Fox and I'm Senior Reporter of Focuswire and I'm delighted to welcome Alex Flamebridge, who's a veteran of the tours and activities technology space and also CEO of Otora. Welcome, Alex. Hello. Tell us briefly what Otora does. So we've been thinking about how we can use autonomous vehicles to create leisure and tourism experiences. And really, that's what I want to talk about today is how these autonomous vehicles are going to impact tourism and how they're going to change the way that people travel, not just for leisure travel, but also for business travel. OK, now you've that's that's quite a, a big vision. In recent weeks, we've seen, I mean, numerous announcements from car manufacturers and technology players in this autonomous vehicle space already. Lots and lots of vehicle trials going on in various cities, robo taxis and the like. So just tell us where Tours fits into all of this. Yeah, well, these these vehicles that you're beginning to see announcements about are not really designed for tourism. They're primarily being announced for mobility reasons, mm-hmm. i.e. how people might commute to work or how locals might travel around cities. But once they are in cities, they will be used by tourists for yep. travelling within a city. So it's they're not necessarily coming because of the tourism um, industry. They're coming because this is how cities need to evolve in order to make cities more, uh, more pleasant places to live. Okay. Now, that's interesting that you say that they're not designed for tourism because then that must make your job in terms of realising your vision even harder, getting people to think about them in terms of tourism. Yeah, a good example of that is that these ve- you know these vehicles are designed to get in of, get into, and get out of quite quickly. So you'll mm-hmm. be like ten minutes, get from point A to point B. Whereas sort of tourism and hospitality is much more leisurely. It's it's like you know I want to go and spend an hour doing something, and I want to see the sights or whatever. Um, so that these vehicles are not really designed for th- those kind of longer. Uh, longer kind of experiences they're designed for mm-hmm. getting in and out so you're absolutely right however robo taxis w- is what we have for the next few years um, <laughs> there are um, <clears throat> companies who are working on sort of more leisure experience type star vehicles which will come at the end of the decade but before that we have robo taxis which okay is... so we're just going to take what we've got and see what we can do with we it ha- that's the plan okay so how big an opportunity do you believe this is? Well, I think it's a a massive opportunity uh, because this is the first time that we can really use all of the skills and experiences that we've all collectively built up in tourism and sightseeing and apply it to the leisure market. So it's a much bigger market than the existing sightseeing industry. An example of that might be you might uh, get a robo taxi from your hotel and you might go to a restaurant, then you might go to the theatre or a gig, uh, then you might go to a late night bar, then you might go back to your hotel. That isn't really a tourism experience. It's just an experience that a local might do or it might be a tourist might do that. And, mm-hmm. and having the robo taxi within that overall experience is it's acting as the glue, just making it all just work. So, so I'm interested then in how you make that crossover of that robo taxi being thought of as used by a local to get from A to B or, you know, with from A to C with B in the middle to that being a tourism experience. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, it's these things are ne- not necessarily going to be uh, a paid for experience. That might be a, a branded experience in the hotel's brand that mm-hmm. it might just come as part of your hotel booking. Right. So a sort of add-on then to, to, to what they're already yeah, doing. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily even have to cost any money um, because it might just be included within the within the rate or it might just become like a like a sort of a breakfast does in a hotel booking today where some hotels throw in a free breakfast and then some don't. Okay. Um, well, well, we'll come back to the commercial opportunity in a second because I think that's important. But, you know, we keep seeing a lot of regulatory challenges and safety challenges for autonomous vehicles. So, you know, how soon, one, do they really take off? And two, does the tours element really take off? Yeah, it's, I mean, regulations has been a debate over the last few years, but 
fundamentally we now today as i'm as i'm talking now which is sort of mm-hmm. may june uh, 2022 we have uh, robo taxis available to the public in 16 cities mm-hmm. um uh, five in north america one in south korea and nine in china so so the the many of the sort of the reg- regulatory hurdles have been addressed and this summer which means in the next two to three months, we will see robo taxis for the first time in Europe, in Munich, and for the first time in the Middle East, in Tel Aviv. So we now okay. have, we have um, most continents, apart from South America, will have a robo taxi service by this year. So the regulatory uh, challenges have been addressed. There are still some regulatory challenges that relate to personally owned autonomous vehicles, which won't come until the end of the decade. But for Mm -hmm. commercially operated autonomous vehicles that you have on a shared basis, i.e. you pay and you might use, uh, you know, many of those have been addressed, including the insurance hurdles. Okay. Um, So so from a timing perspective, just going back to timing, I mean, back mm-hmm. in 2018, when um, I started looking into and, and, and building technology for autonomous vehicles, I used to say to the bus sightseeing industry that they had to transition by 2025. And I am still happy that that timeline is the timeline that they do have to transition by. Mm-hmm. Um, we will see many more shuttles and other autonomous vehicles appear in 2023, 2024. But really, it's a very much a market specific um, timeline. So if you're in Las Vegas or if you are in San Francisco or if you're in Austin or Miami, mm-hmm. you need to be changing now because that's where autonomous vehicles are going to be first. Um, yeah. if, if you're um, in uh, New Delhi, then you probably don't. No. And I think it, it, perhaps, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but perhaps those cities you know, the conditions there will be more conducive to that then rolling into tourism. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're actually, I mean, there's autonomous vehicles in other cities at the moment uh, in the mm-hmm. US, um, but they're not what I would describe or I think any of them would describe as massive tourism cities. So, so th- these are the first cities that we will see how autonomous vehicles, in particular publicly available and he- publicly available robo-taxis, how they are sort of used within a tourism context. And I mean, do you see, you know, do you anticipate other kind of challenges and barriers out there? Yeah, so the big challenge that's remaining now is not necessarily around the driving, it's more to do with the commercial model. Mm. So um, take uh, Dubai as, a, as an example. Um, Cruise, which is mostly General Motors, but also has a little bit of investment from Microsoft. Um, is talking about 4,000 robo-taxis in Dubai by 2030. Now, let's just say, and these aren't, these aren't my numbers, and they're not okay. published numbers, so there's a little bit of a finger in the air. But let's say a okay. robo-taxi costs $100,000. Well, that's $400 million for vehicles just in one city. Mm-hmm. And Cruise effectively has, has said that they're going to have 1 million robo-taxis by 2030 which is 250 the times the size so yeah. we have these ginormous amounts of money coming into the sector mm-hmm. on a business model that hasn't really been tested and certainly hasn't been scaled so someone has got to take that risk and so we're no longer talking about the driving risk we're talking about mm-hmm. the scale up and the commercial risk mm-hmm. And then how does that translate to, you know, to your sector and what you're developing? Because, you know, you talk about a hotel offering a tour as as an add-on to what they already do. But, you know, how is that going to make money for someone like you? Yeah, so I I think more like sort of the YouTube model, which is the consumer doesn't have to pay anything at all. Um, Mm -hmm. So because fundamentally, this is a digital experience um, and it doesn't it doesn't have any marginal costs. So you can make it Mm -hmm. available. Um, we make our money um, from incorporating things like attractions or tour guides um, or dinners with locals or whatever it happens to be. And from that perspective, we have a fairly traditional model, which is that we're an online travel agent. Okay. Except it's a except it's 
we're not an online travel agent, but that's the that's the business model that we are. That's the business model that we're trading on. That you're pursuing. But does that not mean that you are kind of therefore developing kind of huge volumes of content and, you know, that requires resources, right? Yes. So we've currently scaled to um, having food tours available in 70 cities in uh, 20 countries or so. Mm -hmm. And we did that uh, bootstrapped. Um, So I've got a fairly good understanding as to what it takes now to scale up these experiences globally. We are using humans uh, to do the design. Um, because I think the the last decade, all of the sort of the trip planning startups have shown us that uh, you really can't do uh, computer generated uh, itineraries because they just are not what consumers want. So you know that, it was very helpful watching all the trip planning startups fail, sadly, uh, because <laughs> of the, because of their inability to create an experience that people actually want to do. Um, mm. So we use humans for the design. Um, and it now takes about sort of eight to 12 hours to design a single experience, which is about the same length of time that someone might spend uh, filming and editing a video, for example. OK, OK. So then on, on that basis, it is, it is scalable. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've done quite a lot of tests now. In in fact, you know, finding people who are um, local experts and trying to work out what is important here. Is it important that they are experts in their locality or is it important that they can design using technology? So for example, in in Stockholm, we've got a a pastry experience that's designed by a pastry chef and the pastry chef, you know, you can't have a learning overhead to learn how to build uh, an experience. You know, what we want is we want people who are experts at being a pastry chef in Stockholm to create experiences about, you know, where all the best pastry shop, uh, pastry shops yeah. are. Yeah, with that insider knowledge. Now, you and I have spoken in the past about whether it will be the travel industry that orchestrate, orchestrates this ultimately or whether the car industry will be kind of, that's the car industry that's driving autonomous will be looking for content in relation. What's your kind of latest view on that? Yeah, I'm not completely sure that either industry is really set up perfectly to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. So the automotive industry or the mobility industry, they're very focused on presenting as a trusted vehicle because you need a lot of trust. If you're going to put yourself into a robo taxi as a consumer, you need to ensure that you need to be happy that that robo taxi is, you know, is it has had had, has um, been designed with the correct approach. So these companies end up being very kind of solid and boring presentation and the Mm -hmm. tourism industry is trying to create experiences that are exciting and are memorable and everything else like that so we have a kind of a disconnect there um you know we've got we've got a robo taxi experience um in san francisco that goes to a couple of cocktail bars and ends in a 24-hour donut shop now you Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have that necessarily if you're a mobility platform because you're trying to present as a trusted uh, driver of robo taxis. So, so we of have that. Yeah, disc- so, yeah. so the automotive industry isn't really best set up to create um, these kind of experiences. Mm-hmm. And likewise, the tourism industry is not really set up because it's got we've got this existing industry structure which where the consumer starts uh, let's say it's an online travel agent website uh, the booking transfers down to a reservation technology company and then it gets transferred down to a tour operator and that model isn't the model that we're using mm-hmm. for delivering robo taxi experiences so anyone who wants to create this kind of um, new approach has to revisit their entire understanding as to how the industry needs to be structured so the tourism industry isn't very good at uh, solving this either so you do need a, you do need a startup uh, of, of which uh, you know like me um to come in and say look here's the new industry structure everyone's got a part to play in it uh, mm-hmm. this is how you can this is how you can transition to trading in the new industry structure and this is how you can make money going forwards now you it's interesting because you talk about you have a wider vision and that's for this decentralized experience platform for travel. So presumably that's what you mean about the industry not being structurally, properly structured for this. But just talk us through briefly what this decentralized experience platform will do and how it will disrupt the current kind of status quo. 
Yeah, so you've got this new industry structure, which I've just described. Um, I mean, fundamentally, the, the, the key bit that's changed is that the brand and the itinerary has been split off the bus. So at the moment, mm -hmm. if you go on a sightseeing bus, the sightseeing tour company designs the itinerary, they have their brand, and they, they own the bus. But now we're going to be using publicly available vehicles. So the mm -hmm. brand has kind of been uh, sort of split off from the product. They did, yeah. 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 So that's kind of that's the, the, the first basis, which is shifting the industry from being a three layer industry, OTA to res tech to tour operator mm -hmm. to a two layer industry, which is digital experience platform to mobility platform. Mm -hmm. So we shift that. First of all, we shift those three to two. And then we have to think about distribution. So one of the ways that we've designed how distribution can work is we're using a sort of a, an approach uh, designed using uh, the self-sovereign identity approach, SSI, which is coming popular within the hotel sector for different reasons. Yeah. Um, and that enables us to apply uh, personalization of uh, discovery, i.e. what things you might find interesting to do in San Francisco, um, we can do that, at, uh, we can distribute that at a layer above us. And um, so, so it's quite interesting thinking through how distribution works. But in today's model, distribution is all about distributed transactions. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this kind of future model, we don't distribute transactions, we distribute discoverability or discovering. So you, mm -hmm. you and that's a, um, that enables, for example, a hotel to uh, have a guest that starts from their hotel and goes for a night out, there isn't a transaction that the hotel needs to do a technical integration with. It's just a, it's just discovery at that point. It's an end to end experience. That yeah, operating. so it's kind of it's kind of quite an interesting concept having a new industry structure. I didn't really when I set out to do this, I didn't set out to say, "Hey, we need a new industry structure." Um, mm -hmm. I set out to try and think how we were going to create experiences using aut autonomous vehicles. Um, but that, that's where we've ended up. So. Okay. Now, one of the things I wanted to pick up on was that um, you said that, that, that you know, you're going to have or potentially have this scenario of Google being at the top and the bottom of the, the funnel with mm -hmm. these developments, because obviously it's developing its own autonomous vehicles and it's already got search and all of these other plays in travel. Does that also potentially apply to companies such as Uber now that they're going for a sort of super app type status? Yeah, I mean, going just talking about sort of Alphabet Google for a second, just to recap on that. Mm -hmm. um, if um, in Phoenix, for example, which is where Waymo, which is uh, one of Alphabet's companies, um, yeah. has been doing a lot of their testing and is available to consumers, including consumers who pay, um, they've just announced that they've started doing airport transfers from the Phoenix airport. So those Waymo robo taxis are also available on Google Maps. So you as a consumer can go from an Alphabet-owned uh, website and go straight to an Alphabet-owned vehicle. There's no travel industry involved apart from Google. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, it's, it's very interesting what will happen when we have the top and the bottom layers um, operated by the same entity or at least entities belonging to the same parent. Um, Uber in their sort of February um, 2022 investor call did say and i'm going to read this because it's important that i get this right because i'm phrasing them they said that um, they are going to ensure that most providers will choose to partner with uber rather than building their own ride share network so uber is presenting themselves at the layer above like a retailer mm -hmm. um, so it's slightly different to their core network which is what they call it today which is their drivers um, but it is going to be they're positioning themselves as a layer above and enabling discovering and booking of robo taxis from third party companies. So they're okay. going to be they're going to be very similar to it's there's a lot of companies trying to get into that space and it's quite interesting to see where that will end up. But and so would you say threat or opportunity to existing travel industry? Ooh. Um well I think it's a it's a massive threat. Um if you look at the uh, existing bus owning um, sort of sightseeing companies, none of them have got any transition plans at all. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the reason why this is such a sort of a threat is because this is an innovation that they've not seen before. 
-hmm. So if you think back over the last 20 years, all of the changes have been relating to distribution and retail. Um, so, you know, sometimes you had to learn how what mobile was, or you had to learn how to have a responsive website, or you had to learn how to do Facebook advertising. Now, if you're a product owner, you just take those innovations as they come, and that's great. But now hmm. we're talking about um, completely different vehicle, vehicles that you're not going to own, and you're going to have a, a four-seater, a six-seater autonomous shuttle going up against a 30-seater sightseeing bus. Hmm. Well... As a consumer, one of them is private, one of them is public. You know, you're gonna, mm. you're, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a massive sort of sort of challenge on that basis. Um, it's also but, kind so of so they don't, a, they're not really ready for that, um, and so that's that's a threat. But the other reason why there's a threat, which is a slightly more theoretical point, is that, and the reason why that the, the threat will actually happen, um, is because if you think about what Uber Uber did and what Airbnb did, Airbnb became uh, a hotel company effectively without owning any hotels and uber became a taxi company without owning any taxis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and now anyone can become a tour operator without owning any tour buses or without employing any tour guides yeah. so if you are a hotel chain you can now design an experience for your guests operate it in your brand and um you know and and off you go now that's a it's just a, it's just a completely different model, it's a whole new category you know which is to how to, to how sort of the bus sightseeing owners um are thinking and some of these big uh sort of bigger bus companies have got three four five ten thousand buses so mm -hmm. you know they're quite significant but also they all <laughs> operate or most of them operate airport transfers and airport transfers is also where it's going to get a bit interesting because the airport transfer market is going to change so that you know it's a it's a double-edged sword. It's not just the sightseeing side of the business that's got a problem, but it might be the bus, uh, you know, bus, so the shuttle bus uh, as well for the airport transfers. Alex, unfortunately, we have to leave it there. I'm sure we could cover a lot more ground given the time. But Alex Bainbridge, CEO, Atura, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.